Hello everyone and Namaskar. So today's podcast is a continuation of the reading of the book titled Anandamurti, the Jamalpur Years. And today I'll be reading the third chapter of the book titled Kalikananda. Krishna has rightly said, if even a diehard criminal comes under my shelter, I will save him or her from all sins. I will see to it that the person attains liberation or salvation. Hence, no one, no spiritual aspirant, however black or despicable one's past life might be, should be worried about anything. When Pravada arrived in Calcutta at the house of his maternal uncle, Sarat Chandra Bose, to take up his studies in the summer of 1939, the former capital of India was alive with the fervor of independence and the uncertainty of war. Student activism was at its apogee with most students favoring the radical freedom at all cost stance of Suhas Chandra Bose, president of the Congress party, while others sided with Gandhi and Nehru's policy of wartime cooperation with the British. Wherever one's sympathies lay, the talk of independence and war was impossible to escape, whether in the classroom, the dining room, or on the street. Around the time Pravat arrived in the turbulent metropolis, he began corresponding with various revolutionary leaders in Bengal, such as the radical humanist M. N. Roy, Shyama Prasad Mukherjee, founder of India's first Hindu Nationalist Party, Arun Chandra Guha, General Secretary of the Bengal Congress, and Subhash Chandra Bose, who was a distant relative on his mother's side. Pravat's letters attracted their attention due to his astute analysis of the political situation and the provocative suggestions he made regarding what actions would best serve the nation's interest at that time. When they discovered that P.R. Sarkar was a 17-year-old student, some of them were taken aback, but Pravat was soon invited to close sessions at M. N. Roy's house with him and other revolutionaries at the time, who would help decide the fortunes of the soon-to-be-born nation. Despite Pravat's involvement, with some of India's radical revolutionary leaders, he did not join any political party or student organization. As in high school, he mostly kept to himself, spending his time outside the classroom, either alone or in the company of a few close companions, to whom he made no mention of his relationship with, Subhash, M. N. Roy, and others. Among these were his cousin, Ajit Biswas, the future actor, Rabin Masumdar, and the future football standout, Anil Kumar Day. Apart from his letters to political leaders, Pravat wrote articles, poetry, and short fiction under various pen names, and saw them published in different newspapers and magazines, such as The Statesman and The Searchlight. His articles dealt primarily with social issues, such as the caste system, capitalism, and the dowry system, and contained many of the radical ideas that would later appear in his Prout philosophy. He enjoyed the affection of his unmarried uncle, a disciplined tantric, and used to pay regular visits to his aunt in North Calcutta, who later became famous as Lady Goronga, a Vaishnava saint. He also worked part-time as a sub-editor in a Calcutta newspaper and tutored students to meet his expenses. Above all, he continued searching out solitary places to pursue his meditation. In Calcutta, Pravat kept up his habit of taking long evening walks. He often walked by the banks of the river Ganges, a route that took him through an area dotted with burning ghats, some still smoldering with the remains of cremated bodies. It was a solitary area that the townspeople avoided, rumored to be unsafe after dark. On the evening of the full moon in August, Shortly after his arrival in Calcutta, Pravat's evening walk took him through the Kashmitra burning ghat. The bright moon of Shravan cast enough light to illumine his path through the cremation ground. He stopped at one point and found a place to sit near the river bank. A short while later, he heard footsteps behind him. Without bothering to turn around, he asked his unknown visitor to sit down. Rather than sit, the burly, imposing man who appeared by his side 
whipped out a large dagger and demanded that Pravat hand over his money and his valuables. Otherwise, he would not hesitate to take his life. Are you short of money? Pravat asked, seemingly unaware of the dagger glistening in the moonlight a few inches from his face. When his surprised assailant repeated his threat, Pravat answered him in the same fearless tone of voice. So have you made it a habit, then, of robbing people, even poor defenseless students like myself? Again the thief tried to frighten the young man, but Pravat answered in the same unperturbed manner. I will give you my money, don't worry, but I have something much more valuable than money. Would you not like to know what that is? The thief began to feel unnerved by the eerie calm and strange smile of the slightly built teenager sitting in front of him. After a moment's hesitation, he asked Pravat what he meant. First, tell me one thing, Pravat said. If your material requirements were fulfilled, would you keep on stealing? The thief, whose name was Kalicharam Banerjee, hesitated again, and then told him that if it were possible to quit, he would. Good, Pravat said. Now if you wish to have what I can give you, throw away your knife, go to the river and take a bath. When you are done, come back and sit here. I will wait. Kalicharan suddenly felt humbled in front of the boy that he had pulled the dagger on only a scant minute or two before. Tears appeared in his eyes. He walked down to the edge of the river, threw the dagger into the water, and immersed himself. When he returned, the water was still dripping from his bare shoulders. Prabhat initiated him into tantric meditation, and in the process, accepted Kalicharan as his first disciple. Kalicharan could barely contain his tears. He agreed to give up his life of crime and listen carefully to Prabhat's instructions about how to conduct his life. When he expressed his remorse and tried to explain what had led him to such a path, Prabhat told him to forget his past. From today, you begin a new life. The old Kalicharan no longer exists. Afterward, Kalicharan insisted on walking Prabhat back home. The city is full of cutthroats, he said, who won't hesitate to murder someone over a few coins. When they reached his uncle's house, Pravat gave him some final instructions and told him when to come back and see him. When Kalicharan returned to the house a few days later, Pravat was practicing meditation. Kalicharan waited outside the door until Pravat was finished. When Pravat opened the door, he stretched out a hand to his new disciple and handed him his watch and a one Anna coin. Had you robbed me, this is all you would have gotten, he said. When Kalicharan began to weep, Pravat extracted from him a promise to take the same energy he had dedicated to robbery and to use it to serve the creation. Later, Kalicharan would take a Palik initiation from Pravat and receive the monastic name Kalikananda. In late April 1940, Pravat caught a night train to a village in Bankura district, some 200 kilometers from Calcutta, to attend the wedding of a friend. As the sun was going down, he set out with the groom and several friends for the bride's house. But since the astrologically ordained time for her solemnizing the marriage was late in the night, he decided to go for a long walk in the surrounding countryside. After several kilometers, he came to a vast, uneven stretch of land dotted by thickets far from the nearest habitation. It was exactly the kind of place Prabhat favored for his evening walks. Here and there, he noticed a few jackals roaming about. He can hear the call of the Batamao among the trees, punctuating the silence. The only light came from the vast panorama of stars and the occasional beam of his flashlight. Soon he came to an area that seemed to be both a cremation ground and a dumping ground for animal carcasses. He could see several skulls strewn around and other bones that had been picked bare by carrion eaters. Attracted by the poignant beauty, he located a clear, clean place with his flashlight and sat down to relax and practice his meditation. After a short while, he noticed a shadowy figure coming slowly in his direction. He greeted him from a distance, but instead of answering him, the man took up the following refrain in a melodious voice. The play of life has ended, brother. The festival of the world has disbanded. Return, O man of this world, return. When the man drew closer, Pravar asked him who he was and where he was from. Babu, the man said, the road is my home. 
Then he added the refrain of another song, Traveler I am, dwelling on the path. Going is as coming to me, coming is as going. Well, Babu, he continued, I don't want to put on airs. So when I have to introduce myself, I tell people I'm from the Kandil area. What's your name, my friend? Now you want to know my name also. People say that my name is Kamalakanta Mahapatra. Wow, Kamalakanta, please sit. Sing me another song. Kamalakanta sang several mystical songs, each one more beautiful than the one before it. Then he asked Prabhat where he was coming from, and Prabhat told him, That's quite a distance, he said. You must be dead tired. Why don't you lie down for a bit and let me massage your feet a little? After all, you still have to walk back. You must be just as tired as I am, Prabhat protested. No, Babu. I don't feel any discomfort. I told you, the path is my home. Lie down. You're just a young boy. However tired I may be, I don't think it appropriate for an older person to massage my feet. Then put your head on my lap and lie down and stretch your legs. Prabhat soon fell asleep in the heart of the cremation ground with his head in the stranger's lap. When he woke up, it was the early hours of the morning. He felt a sharp pain in his feet and opened his eyes to find Kamalakanta clutching them with both hands. His head was no longer in Kamalakanta's lap. Instead, Kamalakanta had placed three human skulls under his head to serve as a pillow. Pravat called out to Kamalakanta, but the man gave no reply. He sat up and pushed him. A little shove was all it took for Kalamakanta's body to fall over. Pravat felt for the man's wrist and found no signs of life. His body was already growing cold. The man whose home was the path had moved on to an unknown destination. Prabhat got up and started back. Dawn was breaking. When he reached the wedding place, where his anxious friends had been waiting for it to grow light so they can go out and search for him, he told them what had happened and asked them to accompany him back to the cremation ground to complete Kamalakanta's last rites. But when they reached the spot, Kamalakanta's body was nowhere to be seen, though the skulls that had served as Pravat's pillow were still there where he had left them. Are you sure you weren't drinking bang? His friends chided him good-naturedly, but Pravat shook his head. The man was a great yogi, he told them. He chose that time to leave his body. There is a mystery here, but my imagination has nothing to do with it. Pravat continued to initiate a few select disciples, all of them in secret. Apart from a couple exceptions, however, these early initiates were not known to his later disciples. In the summer of 1940, Pravat returned to Jamalpur for summer vacation. Both M. N. Roy and Subhash Bose came to see him there, and he took them for a late-night walk to the field near Kalipahar. They stopped at the Tiger's Grave, a local landmark that would later become Pravat's favorite halting place during his evening walks. A heated discussion ensued. Subhash argued the cause of political freedom at all costs. Roy insisted that India should first pursue economic freedom and only later focus on political freedom. Though the details of that conversation are not known, we do know that Pravada agreed in principle with them and Roy. History, however, tells us that it was an argument Subhash won, with unfortunate consequences for the nation. That night, Pravat taught both Roy and Subhash tantric meditation. On July 3, Subhash was arrested by the British in an effort to halt the rapidly growing influence of his newly formed forward bloc, the radical opposition to the Gandhi wing, feared by the British for the open ultimatum it had delivered to them to quit India. The revolutionary leader used his time in jail to practice meditation, which would ultimately have a profound effect on the man whose charismatic personality would play a decisive role and the events leading up to India's independence. Pravat returned again to Jamalpur for the winter vacation. One day, he was sitting on the veranda warming himself in the midday sun. A couple of women from the neighborhood approached and left a plate of sweets for him. They retreated back into the street and stood there watching. Pravat called them to come back, but they hesitated. He continued to insist, and finally they approached. Young master, they told him. We belong to a low caste. How can we come near you? Pravat caught their hands and made them sit next to him on the veranda. He took the plate and ate the sweets, which made them visibly happy. 
After inquiring about their health and their family, he said, Ladies, the caste system is evil. You should never think of yourself as inferior to anyone. If you ever need any financial help for the education of your children, do not hesitate to come to me. I will help you. In the meantime, his mother stepped out on the veranda and saw him talking to the two women, who were well known to her. She went back into the house without saying anything, but when they were gone, she grabbed Prabhat by the ear and pulled him into the bathroom. There, she filled the bucket with water and added it to a bottle of Ganji's water. She insisted that Prabhat wash himself with the so-called sacred water, and then went out to the veranda to purify the place where they had sat by, cleaning it with cow dung. Prabhat silently obeyed his mother, but when she called him for lunch, he refused to eat. When his mother asked him why, he expressed his dislike of her caste prejudice. After some discussion, he told her of his intention to do all he could to remove casteism from the society. That is impossible, Abrani protested. The caste system is an injunction from God. Many great people have come to this earth, and none of them were able to remove the caste system. The caste system has been created by men. It is a social evil, and sooner or later it will disappear, you will see. Years later, the family priest's son, who by tradition was supposed to be Prabhat's priest, took initiation from Prabhat. Instead of becoming his priest, he became his disciple. One day, the young man requested Prabhat to allow him to eat the food left over on his plate, which he considered prasad, food made holy by the touch of the guru. When Prabhat pointed out afterward to his mother with a smile that a high caste Brahmin had eaten food from his plate, a blasphemy in traditional Hinduism. He asked her if she remembered their discussion many years earlier. His mother smiled. Yes, Bubu, I remember. You were right about the caste system. It's on his way out. After completing the spring semester in 1941 and passing his ISC examination with honors, Pravat returned home once again for the summer vacation. The family's financial difficulties by then had grown quite serious. Despite the urging of his mother to continue his studies, Pravat decided that the time had come for him, as the eldest son, to shoulder the family's financial burdens. He submitted his application for employment to the account department of the railway workshop. His application was accepted. In August of that year, he began to work as an accounts clerk in the same office where his father had worked.